Cotswold village in midwinter. This is deep England, quiet and immemorial, timeless as we're fond of calling it. Yet it's time that makes the countryside special. It is shaped by seasons, cycles, rounds, and by the small rituals that mark each day. The endless cycles of winter and summer, day and night, are part of the common ground between ourselves and nature. They give a rhythm to the year and a promise that there will always be new beginnings after the cold and the dark. As winter recedes, there's an orchestration of new life, a harmonizing of insect and flower, weather and leaf, that brings the early bee to the prima rosa, the first rose of the year. This film reveals a year in the life of the Cotswold countryside. It follows the restless rhythms of the seasons, of the months, of the days. Time passes, the landscape changes, and so does the behavior of people and plants, animals and the weather. As pastures thaw, they are landscaped by the minings of moles the little gentleman in black velvet. For little gentlemen, they're prodigious diggers. Each is capable of excavating 130 times its own length of underground passage every day. And early in the year, it's the males that build most of the hills while tunnelling to find a mate. Cows, too, are tireless workers, but as cogs in the human food machine, they are animals whose own rhythms of breeding, resting and feeding are almost entirely manipulated by us. In Britain, 
Nearly three million cows and their farmers go through this ritual twice each day, and the next day, and the day after that. In modern mechanized England, the ancient magical rhythm of the moon still has a hold on us. And the date of the first full moon after the March equinox continues to determine when Easter falls. But it is the sun that drives all living things by March, it's rising roughly two minutes earlier each morning. The increasing day length and the rising temperatures trigger the breeding cycles of animals and birds, the bursting of blossom and unfurling of leaves. Spring is on its way. Late April and early May are the peak flowering times for woodland plants as they seek to catch the sunlight before the canopy closes. This is the time too when fox cubs first emerge timidly from their earths, innocents venturing into a new world of air, sunlight and colourful growth.
swallows have flown 6,000 miles from Africa to nest here, so their exact arrival is unpredictable. But they've always been welcome signs of the summer to come. 250 years ago, the naturalist Gilbert White noted that they usually arrived on or about the 13th of April, and he celebrated the way that they amuse us with their migrations, songs, and wonderful agility. White was the first person to intimately watch and record swallows as they went about the unchanging round of raising their young. The little bird, he wrote, begins to form her nest about the middle of May. It consists of a crust or shell composed of dirt or mud mixed with pieces of straw to render it tough and permanent. Swallows incubate their eggs for about a fortnight, and once the young are hatched, the parent birds are thrown into a new frenzy of activity. Each day, male and female between them make up to 300 sorties to and from the nest with food. Three weeks later, the young are ready to fly. In a few months, these fledglings will make the epic flight to Africa. But they're loyal birds, and if luck is on their side, next spring they'll be back to breed in the barn in which they were born. Midsummer. The days are long and the nights last barely five hours. Dawn. It's morning glory's moment. The start of the exotic cycles of flowering in our gardens. Cottage borders are a focus for the activities of honeybees. 
and all summer they're able to gather nectar from the same small patch. On a warm summer's day, a hive can add 10 pounds of honey to its stockpile, but the bulk of this is consumed by the bees themselves and by their larvae growing slowly in their honeycomb. As for the beekeepers, they are usually left with about a tenth of this. A tithe, in fact, and perhaps no more than is due, given the work of pollination that bees undertake for us. The alchemy of sun, soil and water in a garden can produce remarkable results. Unshaded by competitors, the marrow's flowers and leaves respond directly to the rise and fall of the sun as if they were breathing light. The fruits of our labour. A garden harvest is more abundant and more perfectly synchronised than anything in nature. That's what gardens are for, to accelerate the growth, increase the yield, to alter the plants to suit ourselves. Yet gardens can't opt out of nature's cycles completely. However much we till the soil and kill off what we regard as pests, however much we feed and cosset and protect our favoured plants, gardens are still subject to the imperatives of the season. Soil needs the winter rains, and plants need the summer sun. Well, that's the forecast for tomorrow, but uh, looking ahead for the weekend, and it's uh, fine and settled, 
A lot of dry weather and a lot of sunshine too. In fact, just the weekend to get out into the garden. But beware, the sun will be very strong and you could get burnt within 30 minutes. But as for me, I'm off playing cricket both on Saturday and on Sunday. That's it for me. Bye for now. Perhaps it's no wonder that cricket, with its intricate rhythms played out on grass, under the sunshine, is the quintessential game of the English summer. And maybe more than that. Have we, without realising it, invented an elaborate metaphor for the whole cycle of summer growth? The fielders stand like figures on a sundial. There are cycles of overs and innings. Batsmen are in and then out. Balls rain down on them and are turned into a harvest of runs. While people play, nature never relaxes. Tiny teeth are nibbling at the gardener's treasured growth. Frog hoppers are responsible for cuckoo spit. They feed on sap and protect themselves from predators and the sun by excreting a sticky fluid, which they turn into the familiar froth by blowing bubbles in it. Aphids are also efficient sap suckers and awesomely prolific too, so they're amongst the most loathed of all garden insects. The females can give birth without mating. In one year, with unlimited food and no predators, a single mother could give rise to a mass of descendants more than three times the weight of the Earth's entire human population. An unsettling thought, and in a summer garden, there are myriads of such insatiable chompers. Under cover of darkness, the rhythms of nature continue. A new shift of feeders emerge, preying on plants and plant eaters alike. Hedgehogs forage for anything from fallen fruit to slugs and snails.
snails are strictly vegetarian. They're very susceptible to moisture loss and so leave the clammy cover of an old wall only when the humidity rises after dark. While we sleep, a duel is fought out in the vegetable patch. The snails munch the greens and the hedgehogs crunch the snails. Spiders catch and eat flying insects and well before dawn they prepare their webs in order to snare an early morning meal. Hunting spiders and human farmers alike, the summer is a ceaseless round of food gathering, of spinning and sowing, repairing and reaping, of harvesting the riches of the summer sun. Autumn nights, as all our superstitions insist, are when mushrooms and toadstools heave themselves from the earth. Their springing is so secretive and strange that for centuries they were thought to be the fruits of thunder or of spontaneous generation from mud. The broth of spores that drips from the ink cap provided not just its name, 
but also real ink well into the 18th century. Its purpose for the fungus is to provide an effective means of conveying spores into the ground. Spores in the soil grow into an extensive network of underground threads. Then, at the right time of year, they sprout into fruiting bodies, toadstools. Although we now understand how toadstools grow, many of them still have a magical aura. The fly agaric especially has always been associated with goblins and witches, perhaps because it was often used as an hallucinogenic drug. It is September, but the template for next spring is already set. generation of plants are packaged as seeds and launched onto the wind. Berries swell and sweeten to tempt animals to eat them and so spread the seeds they house. The autumn cycles of farming have the same aim but a very different style. The routines of ploughing and sowing are fast and purposeful, leaving little to chance. For many animals, too, autumn is the time to sow their seed.
With winter on its way, it's the season for stocking up. Is it any more than coincidence and good fortune that at just this time of year, the countryside is bursting with potential food? The hedgerows are heavy with fruit. Autumn is an ambivalent season. It is, for many living things, a time for switching off, discarding excess baggage, battening down the hatches. For us humans, too, it's the time for taking stock and tidying up. We are perhaps more consciously fearful of approaching winter than any other species, and many of our autumn customs echo our ancestors' attempts to delay its onset, to disarm it. Bonfire night is the only non-Christian celebration that's fixed in our calendar. It commemorates the failed attempt by Guy Fawkes to blow up the Houses of Parliament in November 1605. But it's also close to the ancient Celtic feast of Savine, Halloween as we now call it, which marked the night when winter and the new year began together. Ritual fires were lit to defeat the power of evil. And today, Bonfire Night still gives us a chance to shake a fist at the cold and the dark. It does no good, of course. Winter still marches on remorselessly. Tonight, the temperature could well get down to minus four degrees, so the first real cold snap of the winter. And the weather warning tonight, some fog, but the main warning, icy stretches on many roads. While we sleep, the world outside freezes over.
The cryptic advance of frost and ice in the night creeps up on us unawares, a reminder of how little we know or can control the most fundamental forces of nature. rare mornings, this is a magical time of year. Winter is here for real, and it's time to pay our dues. The feeding of wild birds at special tables didn't become widespread in England until the long, frosty winter of 1891. But in parts of Europe, the last sheaf at harvest has always been saved for the birds at New Year as a symbolic gift to nature. It's surely a small price to pay for the pleasure of a summer full of song. This is a bitter, edgy time, a matter of life and death for many creatures. Yet the year is nearing its end, the season's coming full circle. It's a time for Christmas celebration. And as surely as the sun rises each day, the turning year always brings the promise of hope and fresh life, even in the very bleakest of midwinters.
Stay with BBC Two's Natural History Night for a rare